The people totally justified in going out into the streets, taking up arms. We will use that violence to rid ourselves of oppression if necessary. You don't get black power by chanting it. You get it by doing what the other groups have done. The Irish kept quiet. They didn't shout Irish power or Jew power or Italian power. They kept their mouths shut and took over the police department of New York City. Intellect and charm were his tools. Pragmatism, his creed. His domain lay in the inner sanctum of American power. With the ear of presidents, corporate executives, labor leaders, and congressmen, Whitney Young was the inside man of the civil rights movement. Whitney understood power, and he understood politics, and most of all, he understood people. They said Martin was in the streets, and Roy and Thurgood were in the courts, and Whitney was in the boardroom. One could not have been successful without the other. As director of the National Urban League, Young cultivated a relationship with the white power structure like no other black man had done before, and used it to improve employment, education, housing, and the welfare of black Americans. He was a figure who was calm, who was, was purposeful, who was measured, uh, who could, could take the temperature of a situation and calibrate precisely what would be effective for white and black people at a time when there were big spikes of hostility. But the more the white power structure trusted and accepted him, the greater the suspicion of him rose from the black community. His critics grew vocal, denouncing him as a pawn of the white man, an Uncle Tom, an Oreo, and worse, some began plotting his assassination. As time went on, Whitney Young found himself standing alone between two antagonistic worlds, the tension pushing him to his limit and testing him to his core. Today, both his name and his accomplishments are largely forgotten. And Whitney Young, the powerful architect of the road to American equality, has become Whitney Young, the great unsung hero of the civil rights movement. white people that are working in an all-white business, that that kind of bland, sterile, antiseptic environment was cultural suicide. In 1961, a brash 39-year-old social worker named Whitney Young Jr. set out to break the color barrier in corporate America. There was no roadmap to corporate America. There was a roadmap to becoming a barber. There was a roadmap to becoming a, a rail car porter. There was a roadmap to being a postman. You know, you took jobs, mostly blue collar, mostly menial jobs. For a lot of people, their visions, their aspirations were confined by segregation. Whitney Young, who I thought was cool, articulate, smooth, handsome, my, my man. I even liked the way he combed his hair. It was obvious the way he dressed, the way he talked, that his focus was different. His focus for the black community was more with corporate America, more on an economic-based revolution. All we're asking is that the same conscious, deliberate effort, which was used for years to exclude Negroes, now be uh, used to include Negroes in the mainstream of American life. If you think about a struggle between black and white people, if you can't talk to the white people, nothing's going to happen. And he was able to talk to white people, particularly well-to-do white people, business people, who may have had an interest in settling racial problems but couldn't see it themselves until Whitney Young came along and explained it to them and said, listen, you have a stake in this too. 
Young's talent for enlisting conservative white businessmen in the cause of integration began in 1947 when he took an industrial relations job at an affiliate of the National Urban League, an organization founded a half century earlier to help black migrants find jobs and housing in the North. Young quickly made his reputation by integrating companies in Minnesota and Nebraska. He left the Urban League for a six-year stint as dean of the Atlanta University School of Social Work, but returned in 1961 as its national executive director, a prestigious position giving him unprecedented access to the titans of American industry. This enabled, in a face-to-face -face way, Whitney to really transform the thinking on a lot of people in corporate America about what is an African-American. I think it was new for them to meet a man who they quickly became aware was every bit their peer in every way. But not everyone in the corporate world welcomed a black man with open arms. As Congressman Andrew Young later wrote, most of the business world greeted Whitney with resentment and scorn reserved for those arrogant, uppity niggers who dared raise a moral challenge in a world where profits reigned supreme. A government-issued film reflected common attitudes of the time. Just what is it we are afraid of? Bad publicity? Money? Or are we maybe raising problems to hide our own prejudices? Look, Lyle, I don't think I'm a bigot. Lyle didn't say that, Mark. And I don't think I'm a man of prejudices. At least not any that I'd let interfere with profits. A lot of white girls just don't want to work next to a Negro girl, whether you like it or not. Young confronted this kind of prejudice directly, often using humor to his advantage. So first of all, let's tell people to stop generalizing. When they start talking about them, you know, those people, you say, who? You just can't generalize. All colored people are not geniuses. I mean, we, we have idiots like white people. Okay? Young understood the fastest way to a businessman's heart would not be with moral persuasion, but by speaking his language. He simply argued, integration would be good for business. He convinced corporate moguls like Henry Ford of the Ford Motor Company, James Lennon of Time Magazine, and Donald Kendall of PepsiCo to break the race barrier in their companies. For all that might be said about the, the leadership of King, Whitney Young had his feet solidly planted in the business community, which after all could make or break the movement. At the height of his influence, Young was able to place 40,000 African Americans in jobs in a single year. Workplace diversity, unheard of before the 1960s, had now become a corporate value would have been very easy for him to say, I'm gonna take a step-by-step -step approach. I'm gonna focus on the civil rights issues, I'm gonna deal with all the legal issues, but the fact that he had the vision to say, we also have to make sure that we're getting the economic rights and we're providing the economic opportunity. He helped in many ways pave the road for my success in corporate America. Next week, I shall ask the Congress of the United States to act, to make a commitment it is not fully made in this century to the proposition that race has no place in American life or law. On June 11, 1963, President Kennedy urged Congress to support civil rights legislation. To support Kennedy's bill, veteran civil rights leader A. Philip Randolph called for a mass march on Washington. But when President Kennedy learned about the march, he was unnerved and summoned the six most prominent men of the civil rights movement to the White House. Leading up to the march on Washington, we had a meeting in the Oval Office of the White House. Whitney Young was there, along with Martin Luther King Jr., Roy Wilkin, James Farmer, A. Philip Randolph, and me. And it was in that meeting that A. Philip Randolph spoke up and said to the president in his baritone voice, Mr. President, the masters are restless and we're going to march on Washington. 
And President Kennedy, you can tell by his body language, he didn't like what he heard. And he said, Mr. Randolph, if you bring all these people to Washington, won't there be violence and chaos and disorder? And you never get a civil rights bill through the Congress. And Whitney Young just jumped in and said, President Kennedy, which side are you on? Are you on the side of George Wallace in Alabama? Or are you on the side of justice and fairness? Both Kennedy and Young knew the correct answer was morally unassailable, but it was also politically risky. So Young guaranteed the march would be integrated and peaceful. This appeased the president, but tensions were ever-present, even within the black leadership. Among the leadership figures, there was often tension and conflict. And it was tension and conflict over a number of things. Who, who got the money? Who got the credit for doing something? You say you did it, I did it, really. There was a lot of jealousy on the part of Wilkins toward King and his relatively sudden emergence at a very young age to become the most prominent leader among leaders. Suspicions about motives criticism that you're not doing this fast enough or you're doing it too fast. You want things to happen tomorrow morning. They're not going to happen that way. John Lewis was the leader of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And poor, they wanted to see a much more activist, militant-oriented demonstration during March on Washington. Core wanted to shut down uh, Washington, D.C. using Gandhian nonviolent direct action protests literally thousands of people laying on the streets or surrounding the FBI headquarters. Sometimes the meetings would get pretty hot and heavy when they were discussing issues and strategizing, and then sometimes Roy would threaten to walk out of the meeting. And Whitney was the one who was able to mediate and serve as a, a facilitator and keep everybody in the room. I know nothing that would please our enemies more the, the Klan, uh, the White Citizen Council, uh, than to have Negro leadership fighting among itself. He had a way of using his sense of humor to highlight the little differences and have people laugh it off. He said, we cannot separate ourselves around tactics, but we have to find strategies that come out of our working together. So the feeling was that whatever the differences the leaders could assemble themselves and all work together. You know, Martin Luther King came and he brought the church. Dorothy Height came and she brought the women. John L. Lewis came and he brought the students. And WACP on the Roy Wilkins brought legal handling. A. Philip Randolph brought in labor. And Whitney brought in the corporate world. It was a coalition of these various groups that made up the movement. Whitney Young played a major role in helping to mobilize the country and not only bringing the local urban leaguers, but rank and file members of the black community and the white community. It was tough, it was difficult. But I tell you, in spite of all of the name calling, when the so-called Big Six came together, we spoke as one voice and as a mighty solid voice. We must support the strong. We must give courage to the timid. We must remain the indifferent. And we must warn the opposed. Civil rights, which are God-given and constitutionally guaranteed, are not negotiable in 1963. The thing that my wife and I have tried to teach our children is the thing that my father so often told me, that we must never adopt the worst habits of white people, that any fool can hate. And he said to me, Whitney, you must never hate because you only hate that that you fear, and I want you to fear no man.
Whitney Moore Young Jr. was born in Lincoln Ridge, Kentucky on July 31, 1921. His parents, Whitney Sr. and Laura Young, raised him on the campus of Lincoln Institute, an all-black boarding school where Whitney's father was the principal. The campus provided Whitney and his two sisters, Arnita and Eleanor, an oasis from the ubiquitous racism of the post-Civil War South. When Uncle Whitney and my mom were growing up at Lincoln Institute, life outside of the campus was very dangerous. Black Americans could be lynched for insulting a white person because the students really couldn't go outside of that campus and be safe. My grandparents created the fun activities. There was maypole dancing. There were football games. Then there were always a class king and queen. All these activities really allowed students to develop a lot of confidence. I'd like to feel that I represent a feeling for people that was generated in me by my mother, whose great uh, concern in life was people. And I remember as a youngster how a day never passed that she was not sending out a little card, a little note to somebody who was ill. And at the same time, I recall in my father's insistence upon excellence. And he used to have a saying that a man good for excuses is good for nothing. At Lincoln Institute, Whitney learned the importance of interracial cooperation, that it's a matter of all men up and no man down. Despite its idyllic campus, Lincoln Institute was founded to perpetuate racial inequality, not overcome it. The school was funded by whites who mandated a curriculum that trained students to become janitors, mechanics, nannies and maids. But Whitney Young Sr. had other plans. He wanted to give students the tools to become doctors, lawyers, and teachers to escape the prison of Jim Crow, segregation, and poverty. So he created a secret curriculum that included math, writing, and advanced science. To hide his agenda from white donors visiting the campus, Whitney Sr. would take students out of their classrooms and place them in the kitchen or in the fields. Well, the whites that looked out there, they saw all these black kids doing all of this work, and they thought, oh, this is such a wonderful education for these kids, because this is what they're going to be doing for the rest of their lives. And Dad was thinking, no, 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 they're going to go to school, they're going to go to college, they're going to become teachers. He was thinking all this in his head, but he was smart enough to not say it, not act it, but let them think and act whatever they wanted to think or act. That he was a smart man, and for 40 years, you know, he kept that school going. In the wake of Pearl Harbor, Young decided to enlist in the Army after graduating from Kentucky State College. Young was assigned to a black battalion led by white officers who ruled with fear and inflicted cruelty beyond the hell of war. White officers uh, and white soldiers were not very kind or, or fair to black soldiers. In order to show their displeasure, at nightfall, the black soldiers would shoot toward the areas where white soldiers were. White soldiers uh, did not like the idea of being in that kind of danger, and they appealed to Whitney Young. My role became that of a mediator between the alienated, bitter black troops and their white officers. This was a point that I began to negotiate. I uh, insisted and won all kinds of victories for the men in terms of their being treated uh, with dignity. It was then and there, thousands of miles from home, that Young decided to make race relations his life's work. In a letter to his new bride, Margaret Buckner, he wrote, I began to feel the first flicker of hope that if justice could be won for the American Negro in a foreign land, then it could and must be won in his own country. I got to get this funeral behind me. I'm going to a joint session, and I think I'll ask for the passage of your civil rights bill. I think you've got to make a statement that it's good to 
point out that uh, having that hate anywhere and it goes unchecked. It doesn't stop just for the week. There's a hate that produces injustice. That's why we've got to have civil rights, Bill. But I want you to give some thought to what our approaches ought to be and who we ought to talk to. And... I've got some ideas, and I'd be happy to sit out and talk with you. And I think the sooner the better. Mr. Young was a results-oriented person, and so was Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson had a gargantuan ego. He preferred like-minded people. He liked that kind of uh, practical, bare-bones, hard-knuckle, uh, get-it-done kind of uh, methodology and attitude, as well as being the kind of person who liked a good drink or liked a good joke, who liked a good party. That really welded the two of them together. Johnson, on the other hand, never felt comfortable with Dr. King. Whenever the civil rights leadership would gather at the White House, it was Dr. King who would make the arguments for black rights on moral grounds. Lyndon Johnson, he didn't care for those kinds of appeals. He didn't appreciate them and didn't care to hear them. His attitude was, yeah, I know that. Tell me, what do you know on Senator X that can get me to twist his arm to vote for this bill? And Whitney Young was that kind of person. He would tell Lyndon Johnson, this is what you have to do to get this particular legislator to see it our way. People in the movement and people like myself were very dubious about this strategy. I was not happy with the fact that he was getting close to the Johnson administration, but you know, you have to grant that the intention, you might say, was a good one. The intention was, well, maybe I can do something useful up here close to power that I couldn't you do out of power. He is liable to reasoned and justifiable criticism on it, but I think it's important nonetheless to try to understand where he was coming from. Mr. Young leveraged that friendship, leveraged that relationship to get Lyndon Johnson to support his domestic Marshall Plan. In his 1964 book, To Be Equal, Young introduced a radical idea he called the domestic Marshall Plan. It called for a $145 billion investment to improve the education, employment, and the welfare of black communities. It was a calculated nod to the Marshall Plan, under which the United States spent $13 billion to rebuild Western Europe after World War II. If this country can do this for war-torn Europe, it ought to be willing to invest large sums of money for its culturally torn and historically deprived Negro citizens to compensate for the injustices of the past. My father felt that given the fact that war had been waged, in essence, on black people in this country through slavery, that there should be some sort of comparable redevelopment of our community that had been ravaged. There was no national program to eradicate the economic, political, cultural, social, educational shackles of slavery. There's never been a national program to do that. We desire to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. But in the past, we've had no straps, and in most cases, no boots. That was Whitney's genius. He really understood that the movement does not stop with the segregated walls coming down. He understood that you had to do something about poverty, had to do something about education, had to do something about health care. We have had in this country for 300 years a special class of citizen. There has been special consideration if you were white. We feel that we need not just equal schools, but better schools, better teachers, better social workers, better health facilities. Not just equal, but better because we're dealing with uh, citizens who have been denied so much. Young toured the country to promote his plan. He spoke on television and radio and lobbied politicians to support it, including his good friend, President Johnson. Johnson, who wanted to enact his own set of anti-poverty programs called The Great Society, was impressed by Young's plan for social change. He even began using Young's rhetoric in his speeches. Freedom is not enough. You do not take a person who for years has been hobbled by chains and liberate him and then say, you are free to compete with all the others and still justly believe that you have been completely fair. 
after the doors were opened by changes in the law, Civil Rights Act of 64, Voting Rights Act of 65, he focused the nation's energy on preparing people to walk through the doors and climb the ladder to a better quality of life. Critics of the plan argued that blacks should not receive preferential treatment. But President Johnson believed in many of Young's ideas and incorporated the best into his great society, including such invaluable institutions as Medicare, Job Corps, Head Start, and Model Cities. The great society really defined and, and transformed this country. Where would we be today without Medicare or Head Start? The whole panoply of educational programs established. So many of these ideas came from Whitney Young, who pushed aggressively for the adoption of a domestic Marshall Plan. That was Whitney's core, central contribution to American politics and to the government. Drops her hands, dead. The Watts Riots, one of the first urban disturbances of the decade, was ignited by a confrontation between a white police officer and a black motorist. It sent shockwaves across the country, and to Young signaled that the Great Society initiatives had been too underfunded to improve conditions for the black masses. One of the features of social movements like the civil rights movements is that they generate in time crises of rising expectations. Right? Progress can never keep pace with the hopes that social movement uh, engenders. In the context of that urban blight and poverty and uh, depression, there is rebellion that springs up in urban ghettos all over the country. The reason for this is that while voting rights have been achieved and desegregation had taken place, and now you might say things were better for the black middle class, so at the same time, the fundamental problem of black people had not been solved, and that was the problem of economic justice. It was never going to be about um, changing people's hearts to redistribute their wealth. This is America. The reason the civil rights movement succeeded was because of television. And when they saw innocent people being shot and beaten, I think it disgusted people. And they thought, you know, damn, you know, we, I don't want to live in a country like that. So, like, you know, let the spooks in. But I don't think anybody ever said, I'm going to share my wealth. We Shall Overcome was never going to be about overcoming dollars out of some white guy's pocketbook. It just wasn't going to happen. We don't need anybody to tell us to stand up anymore. Not only are we going to stand up, we're going to right the wrongs of our people in this generation. By the mid-60s, young black activists were growing frustrated with the pace of change. And instead of acting with the mediated calm of Whitney Young and his generation, these new young leaders were reacting with impatience and anger. We had a darker vision of America. We did not have the vision that Dr. King spoke about in the March on Washington or that Whitney spoke about in seminars. The young guys that started CORE, the James Farmers, the Bayard Rustins, were committed to nonviolent philosophy. But the young urban types, like myself, when we joined CORE, we were not equally as committed to those Gandhian type principles. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee were in some ways the shock troops of the movement in the South, the ones who were absorbing the greatest part of the abuse that white folks were putting out. The thing about absorbing that kind of abuse is there's a natural human response to it. The natural human response is anger. All the black power represented a generational conflict. What Stokely mobilized was his generation of activists 
who were tired of the restraints of the movement of the older generation. The NAACP, the Urban League, the mainstream black middle class organizations denounced it. They said it's reverse racism, it will scare off our white allies. You don't get black power by chanting it. You get it by doing what the other groups have done. The Irish kept quiet. They didn't shout Irish pow or Jew pow or Italian pow. They kept their mouths shut and took over the police department of New York City <laughs> and the mayorship of Boston. And that's the way we will ultimately get power in no other way. And, and anybody who goes around letting Negroes think that they're going to get power by chanting it or by looking in the mirror saying they're black or suddenly by stop conking their hair or putting on a black robe is, dis is deceiving. But Young's dismissal of black power fell on deaf ears. The movement had been revolutionized, and its new chant was black power. Black power means dignity. We don't want any more than you have, and we're not going to accept any less than you have. That's black power. So the white press picks it up. It's sensationalist. It plays into white fears. Ooh, you know, black people are coming, and they want power, which, of course, means to white people that they're going to take our power. 1966, for the first time, the northern white man began fully to comprehend the intensity of his feelings and his fears about the black man. Black power was the catalyst, a cry that sounded like a threat of violence, of vengeance, to a white man fed up with racial turmoil. The notion of black power gets picked up in the press and by white people because white people are fundamentally afraid of black people. And the reason why Whitney Young was always so cautious is because he recognized white people who are afraid of black people react violently. The pigment of skin isn't the problem. The problem is that the Negro in this country today stands for venereal disease, prostitution, the numbers racket, and crime. As riots in Detroit and Newark erupted, President Johnson became furious. To him, the passage of historic civil rights legislation had been met with ingratitude, and worse, violence. Pillage, looting, murder, and arson have nothing to do with civil rights. For Whitney Young, these events were disconcerting straining his relationship with both President Johnson and the white business community. Letters from corporations began flooding Young's office. A typical one stated, the civil rights movement is taking a most unfortunate direction. The voices of sanity and wisdom are in danger of being drowned out by radicals preaching a doctrine that is going to do a lot of harm. When we say black power, some monkey said, you mean violence. And then he expects us to say, uh-uh, boss man, oh, we don't mean violence. Later for the hokey, later for him. Tokely Carmichael would have been forgotten if it hadn't been for the white media. He is a creation of the white press of this country. Whitney Young had to reconcile the interests and needs of those core constituencies he was providing for. But at the same time, he could not afford to alienate those who were providing the resource base for his organization. It was a difficult kind of political maneuver. And over time, and especially after the rise of black power, it became virtually impossible to mediate those interests. Black activists began to mistrust Young and openly criticize him. Just before the start of this opening day's session of the Urban League Convention in Philadelphia, a handful of those who advocate black power stood by the door and chanted, Uncle Tom, Uncle Tom. Why the young, I mean Whitney Young, he's the Wall Street of the Civil Rights Movement. <laughs> and Roy Weeknees, Wilkins, Roy Wilkins, he is the stalking horse or the whiteies that would control blacks. They're finished. They've had their day, made notable contributions. But what they're trying to do now, black people no longer have anything to do with them. Whitney was in a very tough position because if you didn't raise your voice along with others in, uh, in the crowd, 
and be prepared to go to the barricades all the time, you were basically dismissed as somebody who was not black enough to be a leader in the struggle for civil rights. What happens when the locus of struggle shifts more to the masses, empowered by uprisings in the streets, the target changes to capitalism. It is now the system itself that is being called into question. So at that point, Whitney Young, perhaps more than any other, really looks like an Uncle Tom, because one of the things he prided himself on was being able to negotiate with the people who controlled corporate uh, employment and all the rest of that. From the standpoint of these young radicals, nothing could be more wrongheaded than that. Whitney Young, um, who was called Uncle Tom every day by Stokely Carmichael and Rat Brown, you know, would, he just dealt with it with so much aplomb. He would basically say, kiss his Uncle Tom ass. And that's good because he knew that he was about the serious business, not as a child, like Stokely and Rap were. They were children. I mean, they were young and they were naive. They were very important. I admired them, but they were children compared to Martin Luther King and Whitney Young. They were playing for big stakes. They were trying to transform the greatest corporate power in the history of the world. And they had to do it the way that they did it. Young stood up to those who said he was too accommodating, too safe, too patient. He redefined the slogan, Black Power, bringing black issues once again into the mainstream. Black power, according to my definition, uh, is a very positive thing. It means pride. It means the recognition that a group has dignity and has roots. It means that a group has a right to participate in its destiny and to have an influence on its own uh, community affairs, to reward its friends and punish its enemies like every other group has done. It helped the movement by de-demonizing black power. So there's a lot of debate around what, what, what is black power, even among the so-called militants, among the so-called nationalists. We didn't really agree on what black power was either. So Whitney had come to the conclusion that none of us can do this by ourselves. And to just insist, I'm only going to talk to nationalists, I'm only going to talk to moderates, I'm only going to talk to Republicans, that's uh, suicidal for black people. It's still suicidal. With Whitney, he understood that. See, that was the key. He understood that even though we're going to fuss and fight, there are things we can agree upon, and those things we will do together. Redefining black power had reinvigorated his white supporters, but Young would not fully understand the depth of the militant's contempt until a shocking incident made the news. Police staged pre-dawn raids to head off an alleged plot to murder moderate civil rights leaders Roy Wilkins and Whitney Young. Herman Ferguson and Arthur Harris are accused of conspiracy to commit murder, among other charges. How would you feel personally knowing that your name was on a list of people to be killed? Well, I think when I took this uh, position and I felt that there was always the possibility of, uh, of being uh, attacked by white people mainly by the Klan and... While he on the news seems to take it in stride and saying that, you know, he knew that was part of the job in essence. But I think the fact that it came from black people, it was particularly jarring for him. I understand perfectly why Whitney Young wanted to maintain that alliance with the administration of Lyndon Johnson. But here was the rub, Vietnam. By 1968, there were about 400,000 Americans fighting there. We had so many black men who were being killed and wounded, injured, maimed in Vietnam. The question was, what are we paying this price for? What are your observations on the high percentage of Negro personnel in Vietnam? Uh, we found out that it's due to the uh, disproportionate number of Negroes who enlist. It's a sad commentary on our society when uh, a man uh, finds that he can get more dignity and more economic security and more opportunity for leadership in the muck and mire of Vietnam than he can in our domestic life. Whitney wanted to be supportive of our troops at war overseas, even if he did not agree with the reasons we were there. He believed, and he knew better than, than most people, how strong an ally to the civil rights cause was Lyndon Johnson. And he thought to come out and publicly oppose President Johnson would be an example of ingratitude. But Martin was much more aggressive than that. 
He broke with the Johnson administration and denounced Johnson and the war and declared that all war was wrong. He instantly catapulted himself into a major anti-war figure. This led to even more than black power, a fundamental breakdown in dialogue between leadership. There were real tensions between Young and King, and Martin felt that Young did not adequately use his influence to make a persuasive case against the war. He and Dr. King had a very explosive argument about that. And Dr. King supposedly said to Whitney Young, your position might be helpful in getting another grant. That was a cheap shot, but it, but it, but it won't get you into the kingdom of heaven. Others can do what they want to do. That's their business. Other civil rights leaders, for various reasons, refuse or can't take a stand or have to go along with the administration. That's their business. But I am afraid that I know that justice is indivisible. I would hope that people would see Dr. King's statement as a statement from an individual uh, who happens to be a clergyman and, and a citizen, but that it does not represent uh, the, the Negro uh, hope and dream and problem and aspiration at this moment. In fairness to Whitney, he felt that Martin's emphasis on this was undermining the domestic programs that both men favored. I can understand why Whitney would not want to go against Johnson in the war in Vietnam. When we went to Washington, our purpose was described by the title, March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Lyndon Johnson in the White House was the focus of our efforts to get those things. And Lyndon had delivered. It became very clear after the Tet Offensive that America could not win this war. It led to massive financial deficits and a curtailment of the Great Society's programs were inevitable. Lyndon Johnson could not find a way to fight the war in Vietnam, not raise taxes, and support the anti-poverty program. All the civil rights leaders, in a sense, were betrayed by that war, just at the point where they were themselves getting ready to reap the harvest, the Vietnam War came and pushed it aside and never came back. And that was, in a sense, the end of the Great Crusade. The Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. is dead, struck down by an unknown assassin's bullet. Is there anyone to take uh, the leadership position now that Dr. King had in the Negro community? I'm not looking today for a, a black leader to replace Dr. King. I'm looking for an American leader who will lead us all to justice. Privately, Young was despondent. He never resolved his disagreement with Dr. King over Vietnam. He had lost a friend, and the movement had lost its moral leader. The pressures on Young were beginning to build, and he was losing patience. I remember my mom and my Aunt Eleanor would talk about how worried they were about him. They said he was overweight, that he was you know, tired because he was doing so much traveling. He even wrote my mom a letter saying that he resented the time that was spent away from people he loved. And so I think things were wearing on him. I have reached a point that I'm not remotely concerned with how white people feel and how sorry they are. Uh, I'm only concerned about what white people do and how they act. I'm getting a little tired of being lectured about, you know, I, I, we must be more disciplined we must be more restrained uh, in a tone which would suggest that if you aren't, then uh, this um, you know, great monolithic white society will take away even those crumbs you, we've given you. Whitney was torn all, of, all this time, uh, you know, because after all, you know, he did have in him this uh, 
core of, of uh, movement militancy and, and, you know, on the other hand, he had to deal with the realities of the world. And so, yeah, there's no doubt he was torn all this time. The Urban League, uh, years ago, started out believing that white America probably had more decency and more intelligence than apparently it has. We saw it. <laughs> We really thought that we were moving toward more integration. We thought that, that every year would see us more integrated into the schools, into the neighborhoods, into the churches, and everything else. But the, the, the forces of, of, of events have not moved that way. By 1970, a whole new wave of leaders were emerging. Militants were creating new groups Wilkins had burned all of his bridges to the black power rights and didn't have political credibility with the radicals. So as Nixon took office, there was no one quite in Whitney's role that was left in the movement. We've been putting out billions of dollars for programs for federal jobs and federal housing and federal welfare and I'll tell you what we've reaped. We've reaped the harvest of riot and frustration and failure. And now they want to put billions more into the same programs, and I say no. Nixon basically bifurcated the black community and said, if you're the Black Panther Party or if you were black militant, we've got the counterintelligence program called COINTELPRO. We'll wiretap you illegally. We'll put spies in your organization. We will orchestrate police raids and attacks and even assassinate your leaders. And so there was a fierce level of repression that the Johnson administration never did, or the Kennedy administration didn't do. Whitney and the National Urban League had a very difficult relationship with the Nixon administration. Whitney was very aware that the League was under great scrutiny because it chose to speak out against the policies of the, the administration in power at that time. I think if 60% of the country uh, were black, this administration would be pro-black. I think it's pro-political. You mean that politics is making the ad administration anti-black? No, I didn't say the administration was anti-black. I said it's pro-political. Young didn't hide his discontent with the Nixon administration, but a more immediate problem loomed. Donations to the National Urban League had slowed dramatically, threatening its valuable programs. Young realized he would have to turn to the one man the black community considered public enemy number one. Mr. Young signaled to the Nixon administration that he was ready to deal, that if there was common ground on which they could work for African-American progress, uh, then he was willing to sit down and talk to Nixon about it. President Nixon invited Whitney Young to the White House to do a presentation before the entire cabinet. The meeting began tensely. Nixon introduced Young to the cabinet as a critic of the administration. Young, unfazed, delivered a vibrant pitch for the cooperation between the public and private sectors. It was vintage Whitney Young, and it worked. The National Urban League received $28 million to support programs for the poor, more money than from the Kennedy and Johnson administrations combined. I have no reason to believe that the president was anything other than one concerned and two sincere. The president said, Whitney, you call me next month. Let me know the progress has been made in this whole area. He left the unexpected victory with hope and resolve. But he would never see the new day he so valiantly fought for. The head of the National Urban League, Whitney Young, died suddenly today while visiting Lagos, Nigeria. He was 49 years old. Young collapsed after a swim, and it's believed that he suffered a heart attack. The water was rough, and I saw Whitney's arm, and I thought it didn't look quite right. So I started moving over, and then I became alarmed. We pulled him into the shore, and I think that Whitney was long gone before the doctors and nurses got there. More than 150 people turned out to pay tribute to the late head of the Urban League. The crowd included whites as well as blacks. And as one mourner said, that's the way Whitney Young would have wanted it. 
The late civil rights leader's widow boarded the plane and stood silently before the wooden box burying his body. Today, a grateful nation will pay its respect to Whitney Young by continuing the work for which he dedicated his entire life. It is really easy to be for what is right. What is more difficult is to accomplish what is right. And Whitney Young's genius was, he knew how to accomplish what other people were merely for. Born into segregation, Whitney Young rose to become a man who influenced the titans of American power. Popularity was never his goal. I am motivated, he said, by my desire to help America live up to her ideals. Though he is often omitted from iconic portraits of the civil rights movement, Young's legacy survives in profound ways. We see it in the integrated halls of corporate America, behind every African American who holds a job unavailable to him or her just 50 years ago, including, it might be said, behind the first African American president working in the same Oval Office where Young fought for basic human dignity. And we hear his voice when we grapple with failing schools and the disparity between rich and poor, reminding us our nation's most essential work remains, as yet, unfinished. There needs to be a floor uh, beneath which no human being should fall in this country. Whitney Young was the advocate of that part of the preamble of the Constitution which says, promote the common welfare. That means that we 300 million people all rise together or we sink together. I think that Whitney Young was a prophet. I think that he died precisely at a time when few people understood how brilliant his vision for racial transformation of American power was. We must understand the distinction between rhetoric and relevance, between charisma and character, between symbols and substance, between protests and programs. We, we've, got to, we've got to be serious. We've got to take care of business. 